pass it over to Joy, who's going to introduce our speakers. Okay, you're all welcome. Like uh, Michael said, my name is Joy Yekwabo Nyechi. I'm from University of Lagos, Nigeria. I'm sure most of you have not been to Nigeria, and I would like you to visit Nigeria. It's a very pleasant place to come to. Today, our session is on uh, the margin of the labor market. I will have four presenters. Uh, that is Blues uh, Jackson, uh, Jason, my very self, Fernanda, and her team, Rupa, I think, and see, I think we are complete on this uh, session. And I will, I, I will plead that we all take our 15 minutes very seriously and then take our questions at the end of the, the day. I hope that is okay by us. We'll take the question at the end of the, the presentations, not before or in between, so that it will allow all of us to speak very well so, and uh, be able to handle everything very well. So without wasting time, we'll ask Jackson, uh, Jason to please take us through your paper on tr uh, tracking, uh, um, tracking precarity, employment, uh, pathways, pre precarious uh, status for mig migrant uh, workers. So the ball is rolling. Jason, please, can you just start with your yes. presentation? Thank you, Joy. I'll just, um, <clears throat> I'll just quickly share my screen. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I, I'm um, looking forward to this session. Um, so my presentation um, is reporting on a study um, that we conducted examining um, the employment patterns of migrant workers um, in Alberta, Canada, from the point of their arrival uh, in Canada to after their work, per work permit expired. Um, it's an attempt to understand how events that occur earlier in their time uh, in the receiving country um, affects um, how they out their outcomes uh, post expired. Um, so um, for those who are less aware about the Canadian experience, um, we're a relative newcomer uh, to the large scale use of migrant workers. Um, we've had um, migrant worker programs since the 1960s, but they, for most of the history, were fairly small and focused. Uh, but in the early 2000s, um, some changes to the, the, the temporary foreign worker program, which is what we call it, um, led to a rapid expansion, a rapid increase in the number of migrant workers um, in Canada. Much of that expansion came from lower skilled occupations filled by racialized workers from Southeast Asia, India, Central America, and, and parts of Africa. Um, at the height of the program in 2014, almost 400,000 uh, migrant workers were living and working in Canada. But then beginning in 2015, by a set of circumstances led to a equally fast restriction of the program. The program uh, contracted quite quickly in the last five years. Um, so first of all, there was a series of policy changes, um, in particular uh, two that are significant. One is what we call the four in, four out rule, um, which basically means that a migrant worker could only come to Canada for four years and then would have to leave for four years. So it kind of put a cap on how long any individual migrant worker could be here. Um, and they also put a cap on employers about how many uh, temporary foreign workers or, or migrant workers they could, they could employ in, in their workplace. Um, that combined with an economic downturn in Western Canada, Alberta in particular, um, led to, again, uh, the, making it much more difficult to be able to get work permits um, due to the economic downturn. Um, and so that this means that over the last uh, few years, there's been thousands of migrant workers who have been unable to get new work permits. While they're, they're, so they're in Canada, they're working, they have a valid permit, but they can't get a renewal. Um, and so as is the case in these kind of circumstances, many of the workers choose to return home if they can't get a new permit, but many chose to remain um, with an attempt to either re-regularize their status or continue to work or figure out something else rather than go home. We don't know in Canada how many undocumented migrant workers we have, um, although some estimated it's about a half a million. Um, so I estimate from, from the work that I've been doing in my province of Alberta, um, there's probably there were 80,000 workers uh, who had their permits expire between 2015 and 2019. 
meaning it is not unreasonable to assume that there are tens of thousands of, of workers who, have, who are in Alberta who are no longer having on valid work permits. So let me first clarify the, my terminology. I mean, I've mentioned undocumented workers just for simplicity's sake, because it's the more common term. But the term that I, I kind of prefer to use in, in the paper and, and through the presentation is that migrant workers with precarious status. Um, and it's a term that was coined by uh, Goldring and Landolz uh, to reflect the nonlinear and fluid movement migrant workers make across the dimensions of legal citizenship um, and that their status is institutionally produced and that our notions of legality uh, are socially constructed. Um, and so this is just the definition that Golding and Landritz um, kind of gave. Um, and so you can see it's about this sense of fluidity in the sense that in, 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 in a practical sense, not all of them are here not, and living without status. They just are not allowed to work. It's, it's a much more complicated situation. So I just wanted to clarify that. So this is, this particular paper is, is, is part of a larger study um, that's been looking at the lived experiences of precarious status migrant workers in Alberta. Uh, it was designed um, over a two year period um, in concert with community advocates and migrant workers themselves in terms of the research design and the research questions was a collective process um, that we engaged in. Um, it consists of 32 interviews um, with workers who came to Canada under the temporary foreign worker program whose work permit expired, and then they opted to remain post-expiry. And so the recruitment and the actual conducting of the interviews was done through a partnership with Migrante Alberta, which is a migrant worker organization with strong Filipino ties and links to Migrante International. Um, we interviewed 17 women, 15 men. We do have an overrepresentation of Filipinos in this particular sample, in this particular um, data set. And that's because of, of the relationships that Migrante has in the community. It's just, it's a, it's a limitation of the study, but it one I think we were willing to accept. But we did also interview workers from Mexico, Chile, and Ukraine. Um, and most of the interviews were conducted in the workers' first language, which again was one of the strengths of being able to partner with community organizations. Um, and so among other things in the interviews, we asked workers to recount their employment experiences since being in Canada. So who they worked for, how long they worked for them, if they switched employers, why did they leave, what were their experiences trying to find work, and so on. And so by asking those questions, it's actually given us an opportunity to kind of do a bit of a temporal analysis. Um, and we can identify four key time points which shape their employment outcomes um, during their time in Canada. So that's their arrival when they first get here, um, the, what happens to them due to the duration of their permit, um, obviously the moment of their permit expiry, and then naturally what happens after their permit is expired. At these four points, we find there are key moments of divergence in their experiences that shape what happens to them going forward. And so I'll, I'll walk through each of them briefly, um, and then and then kind of give a bit of a sense of what we come, what we think we understand about what this might mean. So first of all, is their arrival? For more than half of the participants, upon their arrival, the job that they were promised um, was not the job they actually got. <laughs> it was times it was a completely different job, usually a lower class or lower grade job. And again, it, it often their working conditions were not what was promised. And again, it was usually they received a lower wage than they were promised by the employer initially, or they got fewer hours. Uh, or just the conditions weren't actually what they what they had hoped. And for two workers in the in the in the in the study, the job had disappeared entirely. They came here and there was just no job. Um, so they had a permit but no employment. So I'm just going to give some some sample in, you know uh, quotes just to give you some sense of of kind of what some of their experiences was. And so this is one of the interviewers whose job was very different when they got here. So she says uh, so they just gave us only 20 hours a week. Then aside from that, they ask us to cut trees on his farm because that time is the winter season and it's really slow in the restaurant. So we cut trees without safety equipment. So they came to work in a restaurant and found themselves cutting trees on the employer's private land. So the second time point is what I call permit duration, which obviously is, is a fairly one point in time, but, but it is kind of a contextual and, and then sort of conceptual sort of time frame. And this is what happened to them while their permit was still valid. Um, did they keep their job? How many jobs did they have? And so forth. Um, 16 of the participants held only one job 
during their permit validity, and 14 had two or three jobs. Three is the most that, that, that we've come across. Um, and two, um, the same workers whose job had disappeared when they arrived, actually never did find employment, uh, formal employment um, during their permit uh, time period. So we find here the significant factor is in jobs is the job stability, and it's whether and it really in many ways it was a fortune of luck. Did they happen to be hired by a decent employer, or were they hired by an employer who was exploitative, um, and 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 mistreated them? Um, we found amongst the 14 who held multiple jobs, there were 24 individual job separations. And what most of those were, were related to poor working conditions and employer abuse. And at some point the worker just becomes fed up and they just say, I can't take these conditions anymore. I'm just, I'm just leaving. A smaller number were related uh, to the employer not helping them achieve permanent residency. Because that's often one of the big promises that employers make to migrant workers in Canada, is that you'll come on this temporary permit, but I'll help you Get your permanent residence and so often they would leave that employer because the employer um, wasn't following through on those promises so again just to give kind of an example quote um, you know for example my break time is 12 o'clock when it is busy when i pass the time when i'm supposed to take a break he will not allow me to take a break and sometimes we are not allowed to eat anymore i will go to the washroom and eat there um, so this is just an example of some of the working conditions um, that that they went through. Um, the other thing I should quickly add is, is those that did have multiple jobs, and this also was important for their later outcomes, often would also then relocate. They would find, they would move from, from city to city or town to town to find work. And so that actually sort of uprooted them in terms of a geographic sense as well, um, which becomes important later on. <clears throat> so the third um, time point is at the point in which their permit expired. Um, and of course, all of the, 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 the participants had at some point their permit expired and they couldn't get a renewal. And the key factor around this time point is whether at the time of the expiry, were they still working or were they already unemployed? Um, and so at this point, 21 were still working expiry at, at the time of the expiry of their permit and 11 had already lost their jobs and at that point were not working. Um, it highlight, in, to highlight the use of the word um, precarious status, it's significant to note that nine of the participants in the study did not actually become undocumented. They switched their status. They either obtained a visitor's visa or a student visa, which is important because they were allowed to still be in Canada, they were allowed to reside in Canada, but they just weren't allowed to work anymore. Um, and so I think that's an important sort of subtlety um, in understanding the nature of what it means uh, to have precarious status. So again, just another sample quote, uh, my permit was refused, even though there's an LMIA, an LMIA is just the form, is the, is the authorization that an employer has to get in order to be able to hire migrant workers and because of the four in, four out rule. So this particular interview, E, um, was someone who got maxed out by this, by this you can only work for four years and then you're out uh, rule, even, <clears throat> even though the employer wanted them. And so then finally, <clears throat> there's their post um, expiry experience and their experiences diverge in three ways, and I'll try and do this fairly quickly um, in the interest of time. So essentially, um, their divergence was around the basis of whether they worked at all. Many of them did not work at all. Some of them found what I just call, for lack of a better word, stable employment, um, which means that they were actually working for a legal business operation through some kind of pseudo formal employment relationships. They were paid in cash, but they would have regular shifts or sort of regular work expectations. And then the third group were those who only found informal work, which means they were working for individuals doing piecemeal kind of things. So house cleaning, cooking meals, doing odd jobs, that kind of thing. Um, I think I'll bypass the, the, the quotes just because you can read them in it, but just to, in the interest of time. So what we find is that if we analyze and examine their trajectories over the four time periods, we find three clusters of experience. First, there's those who kept their first job through the point of expiry. Um, second, there's those who had multiple employers, but were still working at the point of expiry. So there actually is an important difference between those two groups. And then the third um, were those who were not working at the time. They were the people who were already unemployed at the time of expiry, regardless of how many employers that they had had at that point. So two observations emerge from these three clusters. The first is that those who are working at expiry were more likely to find stable 
forms of employment um, post expiry, and those that were not um, were more likely to engage in casual work. Second, Justin, Justin, please, we should be rounding up very soon. Yep, yep, I'm just sitting into the conclusion. I'll be done in a minute. Um, okay. Second, those who held multiple jobs were more likely to be working at expiry than those who only had one job. So, what basically this means, what we also then discovered very quickly is that a really key variable in the diverging outcomes was access to or the depth of the informal networks. And they would develop informal networks in three ways. Pre-existing networks um, that people, they already knew people when they arrived in Canada. Connections made at their point of employment, meaning that their stability of work made a difference. And then sometimes it was just the luck of finding citizens or permanent residents who are willing to help. And so then finally to conclude, all of these workers have high levels of precarity. Um, we know that, that's the nature of being um, a worker with precarious status. But there are consequences that, that what actually happens to their outcomes is a consequence of the intersection of um, the precarity, some good fortune and informal network connections. Um, the early experiences, in particular the first employer that they come across, um, really are important in shaping their outcomes. Um, but then also the workers' ability to access informal networks, which is both a combination of the resources they have and the fortune of, of what happens when they first come, also mitigates those outcomes. And then finally, um, the employment pathways are partially determine their ability um, to develop those informal networks, which are so crucial in terms of creating relatively better um, employment outcomes. So um, thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Mr. Jason. That was a good one about uh, Canadian immigrants. Now I'm becoming scared. I wanted to come to Canada before to come and work. I'm changing my mind. <laughs> okay, it's my turn to take my own paper. Please, Michael, can you time me? I will time you, no problem. Okay, thank you. Yes. If you click, try the green share screen button at the bottom. Fair enough, I tried it before. Okay. Oh, Perfect. okay. I don't know what happened, but I could as well go ahead and uh, talk about it. I'll just go, I'll just go ahead and share it. Um, my pep, um, when it comes to child work, I find that in most developing nations of the world, especially the sub-Saharan uh, Africa, parents have children for their own benefit, not because of the, not because they just want to have children. They have children because of the economic benefit, and that has increased the population of nations of sub-Saharan Africa, especially Nigeria. As of today, we are over 200 million people as a nation. And the consequence of that is that we have, we have poverty, we have uh, population explosions, we have hunger, we have starvations, and these children mostly are used by parents to do house shows, to do hawking in the street, to do um, uh, street tradings, and all forms of work outside the domestic work, the children cook, they look after their siblings, they take care of their siblings in all forms. So most times, these children don't have their own time. Their own time is embedded into the parents' time. They close from school, they have to go to the markets to go and help their parents make sales. They come back home, they have to help in cooking, washing, cleaning and then they have to babysit their younger ones, depending on your age. But the argument has been, some have seen this as a way of, um, of a way that does not allow children to have a healthy lifestyle. But most parents have argued that they are only training the children instead of, um, that, that it has nothing to do with um, emancipate, um, uh, 
inoculating the children, but it is a function of they're using it as a way to train the child, to get the child into the com uh, family businesses, make them reliant, make them confident, make them bold, make them to be what they think they should be in future. But some researchers have argued that a, a child that you do not allow to go to, to you allow to go to school and he comes back from school, he doesn't rest, he doesn't sleep, he comes to meet you at the shop, he comes to sell, he comes to walk on the street, that child will definitely not do well at school. And if that child is not going to do well at school, that means that his whole being, his whole future is very, very, uh, is not going to be very bright. And physically too, it's going to affect that child. It, it will affect their growth. They may, not, they may have stunt growth and other forms of growth, uh, other forms of growth that is not healthy for that particular child. And we know from the ILO, ILO for, uh, laws and other things, the advocacy for a child to, to have his time to rest, to, to be at school and the rest is what most people are advocating for. But most parents in Nigeria are not actually allowing that to happen. The child, some of them at as, as 9 p.m. they are still working, some are still in the shop, some are still washing plates and doing all sorts of things. And then we decided to look at, I decided to look at, for parents that are educated, how are they handling this child work? Or what some people will call child abuse. But which African parents will say is not child abuse, it's child training. Are, are, they, are, are they treated towards avoiding this child work? Or are they, are they treated towards allowing it to be? And we found out that most times, um, parents that are educated because of the cultural belief in Nigeria, and in sub-Saharan Africa, that when a child is working, that child is being trained. So most times, the, the form of, is, they use it as a form of education. So they don't actually see it as having any negative impact on a child. But we know that children that, that don't rest well, children that work, extra, that work as adults, we definitely have side effects on their education. And so the, 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 the research question was, what, was, what is the relationship between mother's education and her attitude towards the, the child work? What is, what is belief system of the parents? What effect is it having on the child work? And what is the chance that this, this practice will go down very soon? And from the literatures, we looked at what Nigeria constitution, laws, arts, UN Arts, um, ILO Arts have talked about child work. And from Nigeria uh, Child, Child, Act, uh, child Rights Act, a child, a, 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 child, a child stops being a child when he's 14. And out of the 36 states, only 23 states has taken this Child Rights Act to, to, to work in their states. And of these 23 states that have even taken the Child Rights Act, it is only one state that has allowed this act of not allowing children to be used for child work, to, to work, to, to, to be effective in their state, and that is Abia State. And outside that, we looked at what theories will we use to be able to allow this thing to work very well. And the theory that we looked at was the functional theory, the cultural theory, and the theory of land behavior. And these theories, these theories try to look at what is a woman's attitude, what is her education, what is her cultural belief, how would these beliefs, education, and behavior help her to prevent child work if it will have especially if it will have a, a serious consequence on that child. And our methodology, under the methodology, what I did was to go to the four major markets that are in Lagos, because most of these children are used at, at, uh, at shops, at markets, to find out from the parents, those ones that are between the ages of 15, the women between the ages of 15 and 59. 
and then the half secondary school education that's that's high school for your place and then college education that decide to go into entrepreneurship to ask them how far and so for this 40 for this 40 uh, four markets we try to to give 40 questionnaires to each of these markets because the population of the market you cannot actually say this is the real population and so using probability sampling and uh, purposive method the, the study gave 40 questionnaires to, four, to, to each of the four markets to parents, uh, that's the women in each of the four markets and 16 interviews were equally conducted in these four markets that means four of these people we are giving interviews and 40 were given questionnaires to fill and from the from the questionnaire they filled we found out that parents there is a significant relationship between mother's education and child work people that are educated has a way of making this child work not to be too tedious for their for their children they use them mainly for domestic works they don't actually use them for hawking for street trading, they don't send them out to go and uh, look for jobs that will give family uh, money. But when it comes to belief, we find that every one of them believe that a child needs to do child work. Every child must do house chores. Children must come to shop to help out. Children, if their parents don't have money, must work to support the economic uh, gains of the family. And when it comes to um, the use of the child, there, is, there, is, there was no relationship between how they use when it comes to education. So it is not a function of their education, more especially it's a function of belief, that this belief system that as long as, long as you're a child, you must do the harsh you must you must be part of the family business, you must work when your parents don't have money, you must contribute to the economic gain of the family, to make sure that nobody is hungry. And so with what we found out in summary was that the mothers engage their children in child work as a form of training. They use it as a form of grooming these children to be fearless. They use it as a form of um, making them responsible. They use it as a form of uh, engaging them in jobs so that they become, you know, you have to grow up on time. You don't just have to be a baby all the time. Meanwhile, other people in other nations of the developed world, like where you are, a child that is 14 is still sleeping. Parents have to come, sit around, nurse the child. But in Nigeria, from the age of two, three, you're already taking care of your siblings. By the time you're turning five, you already, you already know how to wash, cook, six, seven, eight, you're in the, in the market helping out. By the time you are turning 14, if possible, you should be the owner of the business running it. And so no, there is no parents that is going to be there to come and uh, parent you around. You are supposed to be parenting your junior ones if you are the first child, mainly. If you are not the first child, you still have to do it. But mainly the burden falls on the first children to make sure that they contribute economically to the well-being of the family. And so mothers engage these children as a way of training them, as a way of... Uh, helping them to do work that they as parents cannot do. So in recommendation, we are saying that because Lagos is a state where the population of Nigerians come because it's a, it's a commercial city, everybody wants to work. There is so much um, uh, loss of jobs. People are not having jobs. They're, so the only way they can survive is to make sure that anybody that can hawk, anybody that can sell, anybody that can go out, should be out and up and doing that. Government should try as much as they can so to support parents with jobs that have at least minimum wage so that they can be able to feed these children. I, if parents have good job and they can feed these children, maybe they will not take them to the streets to go and hawk or to the shops to go and sell. And uh, we also recommend that government should try and implement their existing laws. Let all the state take it upon themselves to say children should not be used as as an economic gain. Children should not be the people going to look for money to fend. Some of them go as far as going to beg on the streets. You just have to be there on the streets. You need to beg to so that you, the money you get, you bring it back home for your parents to buy food and to, to make sure that there's food on the table. 
and our government should equally provide an enabling environment where business will thrive. Because if the business are thriving and parents have enough, they may not be able to send the children out. And mothers too should embrace government policies that says, though the government is not forcing anybody to implement these policies, but if you're educated and you know that this is harmful to your child, why don't you just embrace it and make it, uh, and make it, and, and go and run along with it. And then that the Ministry of Information should do more of orientation, jingles, telling parents the dangers of allowing children to be on the street hawking. Cars can knock them down. Some of them, when they come back, they may be so exhausted to, to, to be able to do school work that if at all they go to school, parents should, they should do that jingle to show that it is unhealthy to allow your child to be, a, to be part of the breadwinners of the family. And then they should teach them that the health implication of having these children not resting, working all throughout the day, from school to off to shops, from shop to store, back to home, helping to cook, doing other things, is not really healthy for a child. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joy. So? We go over to to Fernando for your own topic. Your topic is on a creation of social levels as mechanism to combat uh, contemporary slaves. I hope that's it because that's what I have. Yes, it is. Thank okay. you very much. I'm uh, sorry. I'm sorry because some minutes, some minutes ago, when you started, Joy, uh, somebody upstairs started working with a drying machine, and I got crazy with the noise, and I, I lost some time trying to talk to know what is happening and to solve this problem. But I think now it's all right. I'm going to share my screen. I mean, for this story that I. I Are you seeing it? Yes. We can okay. see your screen, yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I have to start saying that it's a pleasure to present this research for us uh, in the Congress. We are searching even in these conditions. And I'm Fernanda from Brazil. And I'm going to present some highlights of the research on which my advisor, Professor Carla Reita Faria Leal, and I have been working. It is titled The Creation of Social Labels as an Alternative Mechanism to Fight Slave Like Work in the Brazilian Beef Production Chain. We know that the mechanisms that currently exist have shown not to be sufficient to eradicate the problem of contemporary slave-like working in Brazil. In terms of recognizing slave-like conditions, slavery-like conditions, Brazilian laws are considered advanced, but they have not provided effective results in preventing those conditions. And this can be proven with numbers. From 1995 to 2018, over 50,000 people were rescued from this condition in Brazil. And Mato Grosso, a Brazilian state from the Amazon region on which the present research is based, ranks second in the use of forced labor in Brazil, and livestock is the leading economic activity in the state. Mato Grosso has the largest cattle herd in the country. And considering this context, could the creation of a social labels in beef production chain help to solve a problem that Brazilian laws alone could not? To answer this question, we divided this presentation into three parts. To begin, I will be talking about current aspects of working conditions analogous to slavery in Brazil. For this work, it's necessary to highlight the formal acknowledgement by the Brazilian state before the United Nations in 1995 of the existence of work conditions analogous to slavery in its territory. 
often been sued for the first time before in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, Brazil signed a friendly solution agreement establishing a series of compromise, including the prosecution and punishment of those responsible, preventive measures, legislative change, enforcement measures, and punishment of slavery like work. Then, the legislative amendment of Article 149 of the Brazilian Penal Code in 2003 expanded the list of typefighted hypotheses of the crime of submitting the condition analogous to slavery. From then on, work in slavery-like condition became become a genre, which includes these hypotheses, as you can see here in the screen. So in Brazil, these are the, the, spec the kind of uh, slavery analogous conditions. Due to, the due to the lack of effective public policies, which were positive for some years, in 2017, Brazil became the first country in the, uh, um, in the American continent to be condemned by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights for the failure to investigate slavery like labor. In addition to that, a series of projects are underway in the Brazilian National Congress planning to weaken the fight against labor in slavery-like conditions, including proposing the amendment of Article 149 of the Penal Code. The current scenario in Brazil is far from ideal. Budget cuts for state supervision, state internationally held responsible for omission, and domestic court decisions in dissonance with the expressive test of law. Alternative measures need to be taken to solve this social problem of unfair inclusion of innocent workers into this form of work. One alternative comes from the need to hold production chains accountable, which will be addressed in the second part of this presentation. This may be one of the biggest causes of law effectiveness of the fight against this practice. After all, all those who sell products of contemporary slave labor without being uh, penalized. John Rood, investigating issues related to the topic, created the Protect, Respect, and Remedy framework and produced a report containing the guiding principle. From, from principle number 13, it arises the possibility of liability of a company contributes to the uh, a company that contributes to the violation of human rights when indirectly involved with its business relations. And the Brazilian laws also allow the, an interpretation that leads to accountability of the production chain, which, however, rarely happens in, the pra in practice. The third and last topic of our research is the creation of a social labels uh, of social labels as a mechanism to combat contemporary slave labor in the Mato Grosso beef production chain. In order to promote the beef that they sell, different countries have already created commercial labels such as these ones in the screen. These examples of commercial labels are not associated with the certification of social and environmental conditions, especially the working conditions of workers whose labor is used in the production chain, but they are associated to animal factors, health factors, environmental criteria, or criteria related to product quality. In the same way, the government of Mato Grosso recently created the Mato Grossense Meat Institute, IMAC, 
which aims to promote the meat produced in, in Mato Grosso. And one of the mechanisms considered is the creation of the IMAC compliance label that guarantees the origin, uh, the origin of the meat. It provides full knowledge of the production chain through technology that involves the tracking of the meat in accordance with a local law which provides uh, provides on the application of traceability in the beef production chain. Needless to say that ideally the state itself should require such social criteria at all states of the beef production chain. Uh, but in, in compliance with a number of internationally established principles and obligations, but this, this is not happening. However, there is no information provided by the government of Mato Grosso regarding research about the work workforce employed to uh, raise livestock, which means that the goal is to control the quality of the product, but not the working environment of those who work in its production. Another relevant point is that some uh, experts suggest that a positive labor compliance record may be a criterion that potential customers would consider. This is confirmed by research by the Walkfree Foundation that shows how Brazilian consumers would react to slave-free products as displayed here, as you can see. Finally, in conclusion, uh, what we analyzed is that the tracking of our beef production is developed enough so that using social labels would be viable for combating slavery-like conditions. And studying this economic instrument is, import is important as it is a way to guarantee good working conditions throughout the whole supply chain by showing the stakeholders, the, all the stakeholders who are respecting the workers' human rights and those who are not. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fernando, for your well, well presented paper. And uh, the last paper for today is by Rupa. Thank and, you. Uh, Lorenzo. Okay. Thanks. So um, have... I will share my screen. Uh, and if you could let me know if I'm reaching 15 minutes, I'm going to try my best to stay within time. Can everybody see my screen? You can. Okay, great. Um, okay, so today I'm going to be uh, presenting a paper that's actually a co-authored paper um, with colleagues, uh, Canadian colleagues who are, um, although the data is not Canadian, all of uh, us were uh, trained and work in Canada. So uh, Lorenzo Frangi is from the University of Quebec in Montreal. Um, Ting Ting Zhang is actually in the US now at Marymount College and um, I'm at Ryerson University. Um, I think Ting Ting and Lorenzo are also in the session. So uh, during questions and answers, if there's anything uh, that they can pipe in on, that would be fantastic as well. Okay, so um, our paper is entitled Constructing Inequalities, um, Tenure Trajectories of uh, immigrant workers and union strategies in the Milan construction sector. So the motivation of this study was really, um, really it culminated with the uh, realization that um, immigrant workers actually play a very, very major role in uh, the construction sector in Milan, in, in Italy in general, and in Milan in particular. And in fact, Lorenzo um, had ties to um, unions within the construction sector and came upon a very uh, rich data set. And that data set is what actually uh, prompted us to look into this particular issue. 
So just to give a very brief background about um, some of the issues that immigrant workers face. Uh, so labor market segmentation is widely known and um, um, uh, realized as a barrier to immigrants integration into uh, host country labor markets. Within labor market segmentation, um, oftentimes we don't recognize the differences between uh, the forms of segregation and hierarchy that happen. So in this paper, we take the segmentation approach to perhaps uh, a little bit of a deeper level and look not only at labor market segmentation, but the forms of segmentation. So in particular, we look at lines of demarcation, um, whether they are deep or shallow. So we actually define deep uh, segregation as uh, the, the most um, uh, disadvantaged forms of uh, workers where uh, employees within those, uh, in, within those working arrangements are completely entrapped within uh, the, the uh, segments um, in which they work and are unable to actually break out of those uh, cycles of um, disadvantage. So while labor market segmentation is uh, difficult for a lot of immigrant workers, there are some that actually get entrapped in the most deeply uh, segregated and um, difficult to escape forms of segregation. So within this literature, um, unions have actually come into, um, into this discussion. Uh, initially, the union and immigrant literature was often about whether unions should embrace immigrants at all. Uh, but obviously more recently, that literature has shifted to how unions can actually support immigrant workers better. And we know that um, unions can apply uh, two um, approaches in terms of how to support immigrant workers. So on one hand, they can use the classic class approaches, uh, which um, really aim to organize rank and file members. The class strategies are generally tried, uh, tied to traditional bread and butter actions like um, bargaining for wages, bargaining for working conditions. And uh, uh, that has generally been the, the status quo for immigrants, even in, in uh, their strategies to uh, support immigrant workers. However, another approach would actually be to advocate for social justice and lobby for policy changes in order to actually push the envelope, um, to actually have immigrant focused services to support immigrant workers specifically um, in order to remove unfair obstacles, in order to actually implement um, affirmative action, to partner with other social actors to um, you know, enable immigrant workers, especially those who are stuck in the most deeply segregated positions to uh, improve their positions. And that's a lot less common. Uh, we still see most unions applying uh, the class strategies, uh, even for immigrant workers. So um, in the construction uh, sector, we know that uh, immigrant workers are highly visible, uh, particularly in Italy. Um, in, in Italy, the construction sector is still highly physical. Uh, there's very little automation um, and it's extremely craft based. So this is not a sector in which you're going to see um, automation come in and take out the, the most difficult jobs. They are still done by people. Uh, it's also extremely seasonal, as we know, and um, cyclical. It's project based and can be very volatile depending on economic and other factors. Uh, so therefore, workers are constantly searching for new projects. They're moving from project to project, uh, either within the same firm or more commonly within other firms. So in this context, um, workers often throughout their careers trade off between physical strength and craft skills. So when a, a union, uh, sorry, in a, a construction worker first joins the profession, they often find that their physical strength is their greatest um, asset to, uh, to actually be successful at their job. With time in the sector, as they get older, uh, the same construction workers obviously find that their physical strength gets less. And uh, at the same time, however, they are able to actually accumulate skills over time. And so there's this trade-off between physical strength and craft skills over time. 
So as I already kind of alluded to a little bit, uh, our case is um, the construction sector in Milan. Why do we focus on this? Well, we know that um, this is an incredibly immigrant dense sector. So 50% uh, of the construction workers in Milan are uh, not born in Italy. So they, it, they are um, uh, very, very likely to be working in the construction sector. Um, the construction sector is actually, uh, you know, presents a lot of opportunities for immigrant workers. Uh, it's accessible. Oftentimes the, en the entry barriers are quite low. Um, formal credentials are actually not required. And it, in many cases, it actually allows uh, immigrant workers to move from low income to middle income over the years. Uh, so that, that's the opportunity that it provides. Uh, as I mentioned, the Milan area um, has, you know, a very high proportion of immigrant workers because it's actually very open to immigrant workers. Um, so um, not only is it extremely immigrant dense, Milan is also extremely construction dense. So it's, it has the highest employment in construction within Italy. Uh, and within that, it has the highest immigrant workers. Um, and um, I should mention here that uh, construction workers and immigrant construction workers are also highly unionized. So although the level of activism within the union movement is not necessarily very high, they are uh, covered very widely by unions. So into this, um, I want to discuss, I guess, where we got our data, but also a very, very important uh, organization. So Casa Dile is a bilateral institution, um, and this is uh, the institution that collects a lot of demographic um, data on Italian construction workers or Milan construction workers. Uh, so Casa Dile is a, is a partnership between uh, employer associations and, and unions. So it really was established to try and provide um, some level of social support um, in a case of adverse economic or weather conditions. So it uh, provides three main services. Um, an insurance service, so it's a complementary insurance that includes medical and other supports like house mortgages. Um, and it provides training. So it provides construction vocational training free of, of charge um, and also longer courses like two, three year courses for uh, young people to actually enter the construction trades. So um, this organization is uh, has coverage for basically all construction workers in Milan. And so the beauty of that is that uh, they also collect uh, very rich data. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, construction workers uh, often have this trade off between uh, physical strength and the embodiment of craft skills. For immigrant workers in particular, this is very important uh, because as physical strength wanes over time, on the job learning, peer to peer interaction, these free forms of training are very important for them to actually gain. Um, craft skills. And uh, it's also extremely crucial for them to be able to perform various tasks um, within different firms or the same firm. But the uh, exposure to various types of construction activities is extremely important for all workers, but immigrant workers in particular, as they um, age over time and lose physical strength. Now, the, con the concern here is that a lot of immigrant workers often work uh, in very particular uh, um, organizations and in, in very particular firms. And the chain of subcontracting, um, when you move from uh, very, very uh, multitask firms to very the other end of the subcontract subcontracting uh, chain, you find that it moves to very monotask types of firms. So uh, you go from very uh, rich opportunities to learn on the job with peer-to-peer -peer interaction. And as you move down the chain of subcontracting, you find firms where uh, workers basically perform the same job over and over. And not only um, is the chain, the subcontracting uh, chain become very specialized, you also find that the um, 
uh, the composition of those firms varies depending on where you're looking in the subcontracting chain. At the top of the subcontracting chain, where it's very flexible and there's lots of uh, various opportunities for uh, on-the-job learning, you find that it's often more uh, Italian-born uh, or multinational. Whereas when you move down the subcontracting chain to the very highly specialized firms, they become extremely mononational. So okay, we should be rounding up for us to still have time to ask questions. Oh, okay. I will speed up. We should be rounding up. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, our research questions were really how do the tenures of various immigrant groups in uh, the construction sector um, differ between the various groups and what are the forces that push some immigrant groups into distinctly lower tenure trajectories in effect what entraps certain uh, immigrant groups into um, the lowest forms of disadvantage and what are the actual and prospective union strategies to empower construction employment opportunities for these groups we used mixed methods so we included both quantitative and qualitative um, data analysis. As I mentioned, we used the Casa Dile data set for the quantitative analysis. And uh, we also conducted interviews with 15 key informants um, to try and shed light on union strategies. So our results were quite startling. What we find is that there are very specific uh, immigrant groups who have distinct tenure trajectories. So as I mentioned, we looked at contract tenure, firm tenure, as well as sector tenure. So in terms of um, contract tenure, um, you will find that um, over time with age, so the, uh, we go from age 20 to age 65, with age, two groups, Egyptians and Romanians, tend to have much shorter contract tenure. Whereas other groups kind of cluster together and if anything, their contract tenure uh, may even go up. The same story holds for firm tenure. So whereas other groups and Italian born con uh, construction workers have longer firm tenures as they get older, um, Egyptian and Romanian workers tend to have shorter and shorter firm tenure. So they're with firms for shorter periods of time as they get older. And finally, with uh, sector tenure, this is interesting. This gives a sense of how um, long uh, certain immigrant groups can stay in the sector versus dropping out of the sector altogether. And what we find is that Egyptian and Romanians, once again, are the two groups that tend to have shorter sector tenures as they get older. So as they get older, they actually tend to drop out um, much more readily than other um, immigrant groups and the, and the Italian born. So what we find is that Egyptian and Romanian employees do tend to work at those monotask uh, firms that are at the very lowest end of the uh, subcontracting chain. And not only are they monotask, they're mononational. They tend to be surrounded by other Egyptian workers or Romanian workers. And the workforce in these firms is highly volatile. And they tend to do the same task over and over again. This is uh, very concentrated among these two groups and not nearly as present in the other national groups. So far, union strategies have not really effectively dealt with this issue of um, mononational and monotask firms um, being at the lowest end of the uh, subcontracting chain because unions have generally taken a, a class strategy, applying the same type of support systems to all groups. So I'm not going to read the, the quotes in, uh, to preserve time here, but there tends to be a hesitation or resistance to trying to have targeted strategies for specific groups of origin. The idea is that some people may not feel it's fair or that there's some kind of reverse discrimination if you uh, only focus on any particular group. That being said, some of the key informants did acknowledge that there could be specific union strategies for targeting Egyptian and Romanian um, workers. So some recommendations would be to actually have specified and specific training for Egyptian and Romanian construction workers to enrich their craft skills um, or to set 
uh, the Casse de la Fees to be higher for those uh, firms who are uh, mononational or monotask, or on the other side, to have lower fees for those who actually hire Egyptians and Romanians who are not mononational or monotask firms. So finally, another recommendation would be to actually have Casa Adile or unions become involved in the hiring process. Uh, at this point, of course, employers have exclusivity in the hiring process, but perhaps this would um, try to kind of alleviate this issue of mononational firms uh, being at the lowest end of the subcontracting chain. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> it has been a wonderful session. Questions, please, for presenters. And just a friendly reminder, you can click on the participants list and you can see a blue raise your hand feature available to you. Can I? Yes. I wanna know, I wanna know from Jason, please, uh, which are the nationality of these uh, workers that you, you interviewed? Uh, yeah, our, so our, the, the, the interviews that we did was uh, disproportionately uh, Filipino. Um, that's kind of the community group that I was working with. That's where they have kind of their deepest roots. Um, but we did have some Central Americans um, and, uh, and a Ukrainian um, as well. And, and generally in Western Canada, the Filipinos are the largest portion of temporary of migrant workers. So um, that, that's kind of the more common, common group of, of workers. Uh, my, my, my own question still goes to Jackson, uh, Justin. Um, from Nigeria, we are given a five years visa to Canada. And I want to know for the migrant workers, in case I decide to come, what are the regulatory authorities doing to assist somebody who has been in the country for five years with five years visa and um, has been working and is not being well taken care of by the employer, being used by the employer, not being paid well. Are there laws that protect the person that was legally given a visa of five years to be there to work? Is there, are there things that protect that? Are there laws that will protect me for that five years until maybe I get residency and other things in case I decide to come down there and work? Um, I, I think the best way to answer that question is that officially um, migrant workers, uh, the, the regular labor and employment laws apply to them at work. Um, the problem is, is that the structures of the programs that bring them to Canada um, restrict some of their labor mobility, which makes it really difficult for them to be able to actually sort of enact those rights that the, that the laws give them. So employer abuse and and violations of their employment rights is actually a huge problem um, and there's nothing in terms of our immigration structures and, and, and system that provides any kind of special protection uh, for temporary residents um, there's no particular provisions that well there's some, there's one small little provision these days but not very many workers are able to access it so so the broader answer to your question is no um, there are no particular protections for temporary residents to ensure that they're not subject um, to exploitation or to employer abuse. Um, as I say, formally, they, they have the access to the same kind of employment protections as permanent residents, but in practice, it becomes much, much more difficult for them to be able to exercise that. Thank you. Questions, please. We have a question uh, from Professor Adele Blackett. Adele, if you'd like to unmute your microphone and ask your question. Good morning. Thanks uh, for the uh, really thought provoking and helpful presentations. I have two small questions. Uh, one for uh, Fernanda um, uh, on the uh, case before the Inter-American Court for Human Rights and uh, the uh, recognition of slavery. Uh, I wondered what you thought uh, about 
the characterization of the people doing the work themselves. Did we, through that case, uh, gain enough of an understanding of the factors that lead uh, particular groups in Brazilian society uh, to be susceptible to slave-like work? Um, and the question has a, a background because some of the material, in particular the material coming out of organizations like the Walk Free Society, um, globalize slavery in a way that loses sight of its historical legacy right? and its racialization. So, so that would be one question. I can ask the other question after if you'd like to respond. There. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, as I presented, there was two times that Brazilian state was demanded in the uh, Inter-American Court of Human Rights. In the first one, Brazil just recognized the existence of the slavery-like conditions in its territory. But in the second time, that Brazilia was condemned, it was a very, very interesting case that the Inter-American Court analyzed all the textural, all the aspects, and all the reason why uh, this is still a problem in Brazil. So when they, they, when they analyzed this, they exposed that this is something that uh, happens especially because of the different conditions, the social conditions that it's very, um, it's very, é muito forte no Brasil a desigualdade social. It's very high. The, the, the difference between the rich people and the poor people in Brazil is this that I'm trying to say. Yeah. And so the Inter-American Court exposed all this problem. Uh, they exposed that this usually happens with men in determinate age that are from the Northeast, from, from the country, and are really, really poor. And there, there is a, there is a, I don't know how to say, but in Brazil I would say a tie, but I don't know if this is correct in English. There is a, there is a type of people that okay. usually yeah. are, are slavery in Brazil. And this yeah. usually, it's, it's the same type of people. So uh, this, this case it's is very interesting to read because there it's about 100 pages of decision <laughs> and yeah. it's very interesting to to read because you can you can you can see all about the structure of the slavery like labor in brazil so i can i can tell you uh, that this is the profile the the Profile. It's the name that I that I was trying to remember. Uh, this is the profile. Men usually without the opportunity to study, usually very poor. We usually from the northeast of the country and working in the rural sector. This is this is the kind. I don't know if I understand all your question. If I can help you. With no. Uh, no. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, for that answer, and it is helpful. Um, my own concern, and it probably segues into the second question, is to name the racialization, right? To be able to capture the predominance of historically marginalized groups, including Afro-Brazilians, Indigenous Brazilians, because um, it, it's, it's not coincidental, right? That dimension, and um, if we, uh, move into a discussion of uh, exploitation and then even modern slavery without naming the racialization. I believe we we miss um, the 
um, kinds of responses that are necessary to unearth uh, the, well, the, the exploitation, the disadvantage. Um, actually, the word I'm looking for is the dispossession. Uh, and, it, and it is actually different from the exploitation. And I sensed it, Rupa, in your own uh, presentation uh, with the attention to the specific groups that are doing not only work in one sector, but particular aspects of that work, right? And facing, and your attention to the precarious conditions that they face, uh, that that kind of fine-grained uh, work was there. You said a couple of times in your presentation that the unions were focused only on the class analysis, so you might say the exploitation, but not on the other dimensions of the racialization. And here I'm using the language of race in deliberately broad terms and invoking um, the work of Cedric Robinson on racialized, racial capitalism. And so I'm wondering um, whether, um, well, I'm wondering what you would have the trade unions um, do differently on the basis of the work that you have put forward. And let me ask a related question. Do you think it is the trade unions that uh, will be the actors uh, to make this difference, and um, I get in the Canadian context, the the work that uh, um, worker immigrant worker centers um, seem to be taking on uh, is is actually distinctly different than the work of trade unions. Um, should it be? I don't know. Um, I'll take a stab, and then I'm going to let my um, co-authors also jump in here because they are on the um, on the call as well. Um, so, from my perspective, I think that. Um, this idea of having ethno-specific strategies and strategies that are not um, kind of based on the workplace level of analysis is very, very important. So starting even before these folks uh, enter, like those who are taking training at the Casa Edile, for example, uh, to enter the trade, um, having targeted programs for certain groups and having unions actually partner with other social actors. I think that's important because especially in the in the uh, Milan sector, it's such a unionized uh, sector that they must play a central role in this. They can't be kind of sitting in the back seat, um, letting other social actors, you know, fill that role. So that's my view. Um, Lorenzo, did you want to add? Yeah, maybe the second part of the question. So in Italy, unionization is an individual choice. So everyone can join union independently if he's a worker, not a worker, and it's not based on the workplace like in Canada. So in Italy, we have some groups that are advocating for better labor rights uh, and uh, the respect for immigrant labor rights. But generally speaking, most of these campaigns are coming from the unions not as much as from civil society or worker centers like in Canada, because the structure of the union is very different. As Rupa mentioned, the issue is that unions still are, and they self, they say so, but they're not then able to take steps, are still organized in a way that perceive the working class as we must be all the same without making the difference instead that if we do the same for everyone, some people, they remain deeply segregated. They cannot really benefit from the possibility to have a decent life, even if you are a blue collar in the construction sector, because many people that are making a decent salary in the construction sector in Milan and in Europe or more in general. So there is now the tendency to look toward ethnic specific. They have all of them, they have generic ethnic strategies. So all of the unions, they claim for more, uh, more respect of immigrant rights. They have services specific for immigrants to renew their visa, to renew the work permit, for all these bureaucratic aspects, to give them information. The next step is to go in very ethnic specific. Like in this case, once you discover that are Egyptians and Romanians, how you can untrap them. Something that is, we discover all the Romanians and Egyptians 
they work in drywall. So they just put the drywalls. That is, is a three task job. You bring the board, you put the screw, you put the plaster. In one day, you learn the job. So you don't have any possibility to learn anything else. And the Egyptians, and now in Milan, all the plaster is put by a Romanian or Egyptian companies that are made of all Romanian or Egyptian uh, employees. And the other, uh, the other task that Egyptians they cover is a scaffolding that is a very labor intensive and very dangerous, very dangerous job. And the, most of the injuries in the sector are related to Egyptians uh, doing scaffolding for this. So this is something that also it, it, it's, there, there is a lot of literature in this and it's interesting how most of the literature was related to um, new EU countries going to work in Germany for construction, going to UK, going, going to UK or going uh, to other EU countries. But there is, so the very nice aspect of this scholar are also Egyptians who are coming and who are part of this, world, even if they are not a citizen who can freely enter and exit Italy, but this system is in place also in, uh, in the for Egyptians uh, in the specific case of Milan. And another aspect that we can add, the, the, the union strategy must be ethnic targeted and specific task targeted, but also locally targeted because Egyptians are just present in Milan and Rome. If you go anywhere else in Italy, plasterboards are not put by Egyptians. So that's something that the, the level of analysis must be very, very fine grained to be effective in uh, promoting their careers. Thank you. Uh, uh, Rufa, I actually have one, one question I want to ask. Is there any particular thing you found out that made um, the Egyptians and the Romanians to be susceptible to not staying at job or what is it that you found out that made them to, to fall short of all these uh, Channels that you mentioned from all other companies, all other nations that are there. Are there particular things that, are, that made them to be susceptible to enough shortfall, monotask, and uh, whatever have it? Um, okay, so I am not an expert on the uh, Italian context, so I'm going to let Lorenzo take that part. But uh, what I will say is that, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, I've studied the in the Canadian context a lot more, and we know that the, you know, social um, networks play such a huge role in determining these ethno-specific niches. So uh, my work with caregivers, for example, the Filipino caregivers, has shown that um, the tendencies, for example, to go into personal care work after uh, exiting um, the live-in caregiver program tends to come straight from who you know, who you socialize with, and the advice that you get from them. So um, I, I did a huge uh, survey with a, um, a lot of caregivers, and basically they don't use official lines of information to make their career choices. They use their social networks and their informal networks. And I suspect that it's similar in the um, Italian case. Uh, once a niche has been formed, it's a self-perpetuating cycle where other people who are part of that ethnic, ethnic group, part of that social circle also end up joining. Anything else, Lorenzo, that you wanted to add there? But once is the first uh, the trade-off that Rupa explained very well. So these people who are putting plaster boards, basically when you arrive, you are 40, there is someone who is 20 who is much more productive than you. You can learn in one day. So basically throughout time, you're out of the sector. And most of the workers, more and more throughout time, if they don't, it's very volatile. So these firms, maybe in one month, they have 200 employees. The other month, they have 50. Then they go to three. Then they go to 70. So it's a com continuous revolving door of people entering and going out. Would these Egyptians and Romanian, they cope with it going back to their own country also because the transportation cost pre-COVID was very easy. And especially they come from specific areas of Romania and Egypt where the cost of living is very low. For example, in Milan, the Egyptian community is very big and is split between Muslim and non-Muslim. 
in construction, you just have muscle in community. Non-muscle are in the restoration. The other aspect of, uh, I mean, this volatility and how you can stop it partially, if you think, I mean, the only network, the only way to enter the labor market in the construction and to remain in the labor market they have is their community. That it becomes this perpetuating exploitation circle. So what we propose are simple and very one step forward action to try, try to break this circle, to provide these people working on the supply and demand side more skills to them so they are able also to search for new employment in other companies that are doing different tasks, they're performing different tasks. And at the same time to give companies some incentives to hire Romanians and Egyptians rather than Italians or I don't know, Albanians or any other nation. Okay. Anyone that has question for me? Or any other question for any other person? Micah? Oh? Do I, if my screen, <laughs> if my screen comes up, do I stay shared with you? Oh, we do have another question uh, from Professor Adele Blackhead again. Yeah. Okay. It's, okay. So it's just, it's just a follow up, if I may, if there aren't any other questions. Um, and it really is around, so, I mean, you've described and, and theorized the labor market segmentation. Um, and the policy responses are okay, you know, skills and the like to, to, to break out of that. But I wonder um, uh, how much your analysis interrogates uh, the rationality of that labor market segmentation, right? You said the work the Egyptians do is the most dangerous as well as, you know, the most volatile. Um, that's, that's exactly how racialization of uh, labor markets functions, right? It's about um, attributing uh, tasks uh, on a hierarchical basis. Um, and so, and, and that has been why um, anti-discrimination approaches, uh, legislative approaches that hold unions responsible as well as employers uh, has been so, so important um, and also uh, frankly, um, so weak, absent uh, a broader range of, uh, of of supports and social um, supports. So, so I'm just wondering, you know, we've we've got now generations of experience in different contexts with with the weaknesses of these approaches, and so I'm I'm wondering how you anticipate that one um, looks at a sector that's as segmented as construction and and moves beyond. Uh, the hardening of uh, racialization. Rupa, you want to answer? Uh, I mean, it's that's a very, very, uh, I mean, right on point, but a very difficult uh, issue to kind of tackle in in kind of uh, a policy possible kind of way. But certainly, I absolutely agree with you. I, I think that this is uh, something that has been, this is not a surprise. I mean, this is not something that uh, was a shock finding. We know this to be the case in sector after sector. And, and I think construction is a really um, just perfect ca case study of the ways in which the deep lines of segmentation happen um, and the ways in which those uh, hierarchical levels are um, impermissible or impermeable. Um, and so, you know, I think that it, it takes more than these little policy tweaks. We, I've come, I absolutely recognize that these little policy tweaks may help a few people, maybe. But the actual structure of the system is a much bigger issue. And um, I mean, I don't have a very good answer for that. Lorenzo. I guess I'm looking at construction at what I know 
the best because I was also a union executive for union for construction sector. It's a matter of policy and laws, yes, but keep in mind that enforcement is almost impossible in construction. Because there is so much this revolving door of people changing the, the ability to have inspectors. And finally, so one, uh, one aspect has been even embedded in the collective agreement of construction is there, if I found that the last level of subcontracting that the labor rights are not respected, the first, the first firm has to, is accountable. Okay, so unions, they go to the first firm, they don't go. This, yeah, but doesn't change the fact that uh, these, these, uh, these workers are just doing monotask works and are embedded in these uh, niches that are strongly a fortress from which they cannot go out. For sure, we can have some laws that can, I mean, favor training and empower the skills as a power in the labor market for these workers. And probably we might have some arrangement between uh, unions and employers and Catruca Sedile, this kind of inter interesting third party that can be also a partnership, it can be a new partner to empower people to do not leave, to do not leave recruitment to communities, especially in these cases. If not, the result is what we see, but to try to formalize at least in some way recruitment and once we are able to kind of extract people from these niches, then there can be a ripple effect for others that they can follow up in this uh, spillover effect in other more in between brackets, multinational and multitask firms. So yes, it's a matter of policy, but especially it's a matter of strategy of union or other organization that really wants to empower but I want to add there that, you know, in our key informant interviews. Rupa, can we just, we have, oh, less, okay. we have less than three minutes. Okay. I was just going to say one so, quick thing. So we should be rounding up. Okay. I was just going to say one quick thing, which is, I agree with all of that, Lorenzo, but even in the key informant interviews we did do, the appetite for actually taking any of those, uh, you know, affirmative kind of actions was not there. There was a sense that this would be seen as unfair by other people, people wouldn't be okay with this. So I think that there's still a lot of work to be done for actually convincing people that this is important. Yeah, there was a tension between union doing a fair action because they recognize that these ethnic targeted actions are important to provide fairness, but at the same time, they feel that the restitution is at risk vis-a-vis -vis the public opinion. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'll just put up this for my, for anybody that wants to see. I want to say a very big thank you for all of us for coming. Hope that we meet in Sweden in 2021 without COVID-19, we'll all be present. Thank you for so much for the presenters, so for presenting your work. And to my technical man, Michael, I'm very grateful. I'll still send my slide to you, but I don't know how, but thank you everybody. I think it's one of those uh, COVID-19 issues that happened to my, to my slide. Thank you everyone. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you everyone.